intro on you. He is the Margaret W. Kelly Professor of Chemistry. Um, he has served the Connecticut College community for over 30 years. He is a distinguished faculty and researcher within his field of chemistry and has gone above and beyond in his roles at the college. He has served as the chair of the chemistry department, has mentored countless students by having them be a part of his research projects and serves as the faculty athletics representative to the NCAA for our college. Um, I can't think of a better person to, to lead this panel, um, has such an influence, such a leadership role um, as a faculty at Connecticut College and also has partnered with, with athletics um, and helped bridge the gap between um, both campuses. So thank you so much, Stan, for all you've done. Um, I'm excited to hear from your colleagues. Um, and I know this will be a great event for all of our student athletes. All right, well, thanks. Uh, and thanks to uh, you and Emily and Hannah for putting this together. And thanks to, for my faculty colleagues to join us. And hey, thanks for all you juniors to coming in today. Um, so um, that's enough introduction of me. I'm gonna go around the horn and uh, call on my faculty colleagues. Uh, and what I'll do is I'll just call on you folks and, and let you introduce yourselves. We'll go around the horn and then we'll come back a second time and you guys can talk a little bit about your program specifically, okay? All right, so Purva, why don't you get, get us started? Hi, my name is Purva Mukherjee. I'm the chair of the economics department. And Mark? Hi, my name is Mark Stelsner. Um, I'm also uh, in the economics department. Um, yeah. Uh, Marianne? Marianne Borelli, I'm in the government department and I'm affiliated with American Studies. I teach US politics. Uh, Ruth? Hi everyone, I'm Ruth Gron. I'm in the Department of Psychology. And today I'm also representing um, neuroscience because my colleague Joe Schroeder is having connectivity issues. So oh, okay. I've, um, but luckily Anne is here, so we'll take care of both, no problem. All right, I'll, I'll skip Joe for now though. Go ahead, Anne. <laughs> I'm Anne Devlin, I'm in with Ruth in the Department of Psychology. And uh, Deb? Hi, I'm Deborah Eastman. I'm in the Department of Biology. And Noel? Hi, everyone. I'm Noel Garrett. I'm the Dean of Academic Support, the Executive Director of the Academic Resource Center, and I teach the accounting sequence for the finance minor. And Bob? Hey, everyone. Bob Kine. I'm uh, in the Chemistry Department and also uh, Conn College, Class of 07. And what else? And uh, I swam uh, for a couple of years at Conn, and I also played water polo for four years. Uh, so it really uh, captured the whole Con College experience, I think. All right, we're going to come back around. Perva and Mark, why don't you talk a little bit about the econ department? Perva, you want to start? Oh, I was going to say the same thing to you. <laughs> <laughs> OK, I guess I could start. Um, I have these kind of prepared remarks. Uh, so our department offers um, two majors and two minors. Um, this gives students the opportunity to approach the discipline in a number of flexible, uh, flexible ways, depending on your specific interests and future career plans. Um, there are a diverse set of career paths that you could follow. Uh, you could go into NGOs, non-governmental uh, organizations, hospitals, um, healthcare industry in general, financial firms, investment banks, real estate, consultancy, insurance, policy think tanks, and then there's graduate school, of course. Uh, a lot of our students go directly to graduate school as well, to policy school, um, finance, business, accounting. Uh, the research that's going on currently in the department with students and faculty collaborations as well as honors theses um, are in a broad range of very relevant, I think, fields. Um, for example, I'll just give you a few examples. Quantifying perceptions of college students on the price of education. This is in behavioral economics, discrimination and biases that might creep in when computer algorithms determine the fate of job market applications. This is actually Professor Stelsner's uh, research with a student. Uh, this falls into the category, I think, of economics and inequality. Uh, what happens to the stock market and, and the field of finance in general when algorithms do most of the decision making without human input? This is um, financial development and international finance. Uh, impacts of changes in minimum wages, which is very politically relevant um, and, and uh, relevant on the ground for um, regular folk uh, in labor economics. Uh, up and coming payment systems like bitcoins and digital currencies, international finance again. 
So that's it for me, Mark. That was that was um, great. I, I see what I can add to that. Um, yeah, so economics is a super exciting major because you can really do a lot of things from economics, as Purvis said. You can go into finance, you can go into business, you can go into think tanks, um, you can go into graduate school. Um, and there's a, a ton of interesting topics in economics, also as Purvis said, from uh, inequality to healthcare to um, things like the impact of the minimum wage, economic growth, uh, climate change. Um, inside the, the department, um, there's a ton of opportunities to engage in research either with a faculty advisor or um, with a faculty member, like, a, like working on something together. Um, for example, there's ConSharp, which is not specific to the economics department, but it can be utilized to fund research uh, to, to, to um, uh, look at with the faculty member over the summer. Um, it's more common in the, the junior year uh, of, the, of the students' um, years here, but it can also take place in their sophomore year. Um, there's other uh, funding opportunities, and yeah, um, economics is a very exciting major, and uh, yeah, I'll stick with it. Uh, Marianne, you want to give us a quick rundown of uh, government and American studies? Sure. So the government department has two majors. One is government, and that is a disciplinary specific major. Um, it's called political science or politics at many schools. It all depends on when your department was established. We were established earlier, and so we're a government department. And that covers the four fields of political science. So political theory, international relations, comparative politics, and US politics. And then we also host the multidisciplinary major, international relations. Um, and students, in addition to taking courses in our department in foreign policy, international relations, comparative politics, right? They also take courses in history, English, and a variety of other fields and supplement that work with advanced language study. So two majors in government um, with a variety of different angles to them, and we're very proud of both of them. I teach U.S. politics, as I mentioned before, and we have strong connections in um, across our department with the different centers. And so in particular, we often work with students who are in CISLA who do um, international studies and um, with students in the Holleran Center and the Goodwin Nearing Center. Both of those are um, often more domestic, but uh, maybe international. Holleran for community action, public policy, and then Goodwin Nearing on environmental studies. Um, and that really goes to one of the hallmarks of the government department in terms of its outreach, because we're very proud of the fact that our faculty work across the college with diverse departments and programs and centers. Um, and we follow our students in that regard. We've had, um, I think we often think about faculty as mentoring students, but students also mentor us and they push us beyond our comfort zones. So I'm going to follow uh, Professor McCarrigy's lead a little bit and tell you just a brief um, list of a couple of the honors theses for this year. We have a student who's working on gubernatorial power and the ways in which the COVID epidemic has expanded the governor's power to the point of um, potentially overturning le legislation and legislative legacies and then overtaking the judicial branch, both of those branches having been closed for large sec sections of the last year, right? We have a student who is looking at the dynamics of um, uh, racial awareness and, and self-identification among college students and what effect that has both on family dynamics when they return home, um, looking that as a form of par political participation and uh, again, mobilizing parents, right? Um, and then also on the college and the ways in which organization, organizations at the college bind together, um, student organizations bind together classroom and individual development. So um, as you can feel those, those fields, those theses overlap a series of fields. Um, in terms of careers for government, um, our folks tend to go into public policy. We have quite a few folks who are sitting on the Hill doing a variety of different kinds of work as Hill staffers um, in Congress. We have a large number of folks who go to law school. That's probably one of our major graduate school experiences. Not all go into legal practice. Um, but they relish that kind of uh, training. And then business is very common for us. Um, and uh, Noel Garrett, Dean Garrett's uh, entrepreneurship is very popular with our uh, students as is the peace and conflict and the social justice and sustainability pathways. In terms of American studies, uh, this is a transdisciplinary major, which means that it really brings together and blends a variety of different disciplines. It has, I would say three major themes to it. It is intensely transnational. 
we study the United States in context, not as an individual or separate nation. It examines, it takes a critical approach and reflective approach to the study of race and ethnicity, and it investigates the workings of gender. So you can see that this is a dynamic um, uh, program. And within that program, there are three concentrations. One, critical race and ethnicity. Another, the expressive arts and cultural studies. And the third, politics, policy, and society. And so you can feel kind of the departments um, across the department, uh, across the college, all 36 of them, um, having a large part to play in the American studies program. Um, likewise, honor study and independent studies, likewise, a lot of involvement in the centers from the American studies students and um, their careers are even more diverse because you're really spanning more divisions. Um, in addition to the social scientists, we have a tremendous array of arts folks. And so we're seeing a lot of museum studies, archival studies um, and the like for the expressive arts. Um, the thing that I would just draw forward, and I think that this is really a beautiful testimony on in our two departments. Um, so we had a student uh, who graduated in 1995, Bill Robinson, who passed away. And all of his friends from that time period, and that time period stretched years after and years before, came together to create the Robinson Award, which is, um, kind of, it's given to the students that we don't even realize how hard they're working because they just keep marching forward. And it's a, it's a brilliant award that comes from our alums. And in the American Studies program, that same kind of like awareness of the person and the commitment to learning is evident in the senior award in the American Studies program is voted by the senior class. So I think that that sense of agency and commitment, it makes me very proud of our majors and our departments. And I think it's very much a characteristic of Connecticut College. Thanks, okay, Dave. I, I think it's a good time to start letting this, uh, uh, some of the students here, the perspectives ask some questions. Um, those of you who haven't been able to introduce your departments, well, we can probably hit those on the fly as we go along. Um, so uh, Mackenzie, you got anything for uh, to want to ask the panel? Yeah, so no, um, no questions have been submitted yet through our question and answer. So whoever's live on here and you have questions as they come in, um, whether it's specific faculty um, or you know majors, um, please ask those questions. But I guess you know one that we could ask um, off the bat is is how um, do student athletes and faculty work together to succeed at Con? Um, how do they balance sports and academics? Okay, I'm going to cue up Bob Kine here since you were actually a student athlete at the college. Sure. Yeah. So I found uh, both teams I was on swimming and water polo, the coaches were extremely supportive uh, and flexible, especially with uh, the chemistry major, uh, the ACS certified chem major that I was doing was pretty demanding. I did uh, research for about two and a half years too. So uh, between uh, the professors and the faculty, uh, I got the flexibility I needed to get everything done, both uh, in the pool uh, and in the lab. Uh, and uh, Importantly, uh, for my experience at Con, both department, uh, both the department and my, the coaches uh, supported me going abroad. So I went to Australia, backpacked around New Zealand uh, for a couple weeks too. Uh, so, you know, really, I, I felt that uh, the college came out in full force to support both my uh, academic and athletic and personal growth goals uh, throughout the four years I was there. Yeah, and I'm going to jump in because Bob was one of my students, and and uh, when he when he went abroad, um, we have a course that's only offered one semester every other year, and his abroad year conflicted with that. So what we did was we found him a course that was close enough uh, when he went abroad, and then did a few things with independent studies to make it work. So uh, we try to be flexible because obviously study abroad is a really important thing, and it's and especially in a sport like swimming. Uh, where you might span two semesters, that becomes even more challenging. Noel, do you have anything? to, Because you see a lot of different students from a lot of different areas. Yeah, thank you, Stan. <clears throat> Excuse me. In the Academic Resource Center, we see we see all. I mean, truly, we see all students. Um, but I also work uh, directly with three of the teams: so men's soccer, uh, men's lacrosse, and men's basketball. But I also work with a lot of the teams, uh, just to make sure that students are aware that that th there are resources available to you through the Academic resource center um, you know we offer we offer tutoring we offer one-on-one -on -one strategic counseling 
um, for students like Bob who are, you know, double sport teams and want to want to go abroad, we'll work with with students to make sure that there is a, a really good plan to, to make that happen. Because I'll, I'll echo what Stan said is that, um, you know, we, we want to make sure that that students get that opportunity. That's really important to a Connecticut college education. So um, but I end up getting to know quite a few of the athletes um, and truly once I'm, I'm going to say this. Once the athletes started using the Academic Resource Center, we just the floodgates open for the rest of the college. So, um, so that it's not a place where you come in if there's just a problem. It's a place you come in to say, you know, how do I make this happen? So, and we can talk much more about all those resources. Yeah, and if I could jump in real quick, one one more thing. Um, uh, when I was abroad, I actually played water polo. Uh, for the university I was at uh, because they had a club team. So there was no NCAA conflict or anything. Uh, so, you know, that just because you're going abroad doesn't mean you can't, uh, can't train it and stay in it and, you know, see how other teams work. You know, it was a short uh, and not terribly distinguished international career, but it was fun. Mm -hmm. Yeah, if I can just say to um, the Academic Resource Center, from a coach's perspective, um, is our number one um, advice we give to student athletes the first day they get on campus, use the, use the ARC. And they do. I think, you know, every college has um, a resource center or tutors or help, but nobody does it like Khan. Um, our academic resource center is above and beyond, and it's a normal thing for students and student athletes to use. Um, so it's something that um, sets us apart and, and definitely you should be excited about. Yeah, the Academic Resource Center is great. And for some lucky classes, they, they assign tutors for the class, which are students that have previously taken the class, which is in addition to office hours with the professor, but a, another resource out there, which is, is just so much help. Yeah, I'll, I'll jump on in that. And um, I'm in the biology department, Deborah Eastman, um, and we have a, a peer mentor program that we collaborate with the, um, um, the ARC and it's been really fantastic, the, the support from the ARC. And, and actually the peer mentors we have um, are often, often athletes. Um, so uh, so th that's been super awesome. Also just wanted to um, say, I was counting the number of athletes I have in my bio 209, which is our 200 level cells and molecules course um, right now. So there's, it's a, it's about a 34, I think it's 34 students in there and more than 40, I think 40 some percent of the students actually are varsity athletes. So there's soccer players, there's um, swimmers, track and field, uh, cross country, uh, tennis, hockey and water polo. Um, and, um, and so, you know, the sort of the balance of labs, we have multiple sections for labs, which is helpful sometimes if students have um, athletes have a, a game or practice um, that they can't miss. They, you know, we can, they can go to a different uh, lab section. Um, so uh, yeah, so we work, we work together to, to, you know, to make sure um, can be excelling at your best um, in, in everything you're engaged in. I, uh, I taught Jen Kem one year and I had, a, I think uh, two entire women's ice hockey defensive lines in my class. Anyway, uh, well, Ruth, why don't you and uh, Ann talk a little bit about, I see a double major question in the, in the questions. Um, the question is, is double majoring an option or an option you would recommend? Thank you. you go ahead, Ann, or should I? Yeah. Okay, I'll go ahead. So, um, so regarding the question of double majoring, I think that's a, a good question related to neuroscience because a lot of our neuroscience majors are double majoring. Um, ones I've talked to recently are double majoring in um, neuroscience and dance. That seemed to be a popular combination. Um, and it works really well because there's some overlap uh, in understanding physiology and expression. And I think that that is something that appeals to students um, who are interested in both of those areas. So yeah, it is possible. Um, it takes some planning and some work with an advisor and that's something that we view as a real strength is our advising and um, regardless of which major you choose, you will work closely with an advisor to work out your schedule. That's especially important in an interdisciplinary major like neuroscience where you have to navigate the schedules in multiple departments and understand when things are offered and um, which things you would like to take because there's so many options available to you. 
in an interdisciplinary major. So that's, that's a time when working with an advisor is really crucial. And it's something that we, we pay close attention to. So I think that that's, that's a, definitely a benefit that helps students um, engage in a lot of different uh, curricular uh, activities across the campus, not just in one major. And I, I would add to that, uh, I see both convergent and divergent approaches to double majoring. So you might see students who are doing psychology and neuroscience or psychology and human development, for example, but I have students who do psychology and dance, psychology and theater, um, and maybe someplace in between psychology and economics. So I think we support, this is a, a liberal arts institution and we support the idea of pursuing multiple interests. Uh, and, and it's uh, easy, easy to see connections when you do that. By the way, and for those of you out there, Anne Devlin is the, by far the best figure skater on our faculty. <laughs> I will uh, actually say that's true. <laughs> thank you for that question, Kate. Uh, <laughs> Kate uh, asks, uh, with the government area, the study abroad play a prominent role in the education? Thanks for that question, Kate. So that's for the Gov Department? Yes. Okay. Well, you can probably answer. Other people can chime in about study abroad in general. Absolutely, and please do. Um, a great many of our students do study away. I think um, it's it's more, well, it's a large percentage of the junior class and it's the majority of government and international relations majors, but it's not a requirement. It's actively encouraged and strongly supported. Um, but we understand that different people have different priorities, constraints, and opportunities. So let me stress it from both sides. Yes and yes. Um, <laughs> With regard to study away, the thing that, the, that we're looking at also is to really bring it back so that it's not just this isolated experience, but instead to integrate it into your studies and, and your learning. So that when you're preparing to go abroad, you're going to have, as, as um, professors Gron and Devlin said, you're going to have conversations with your advisors about how you prepared for this in terms of your coursework, in terms of your knowledge. And then also personally, because for folks who haven't traveled a great deal, it's going to be it's going to be a challenge living in a different culture, a different environment, particularly homestays, um, when you don't necessarily understand why families are making the choices that they're making that are impacting you so profoundly. Um, also, in a time of COVID, what we're trying to do now is really develop our research opportunities so that people can reach out more strongly in times when communications are are really profoundly limited. Um, so I would say, yes, uh, study away is supported and encouraged, and so are the alternatives to it in a time when travel is more difficult. Anybody got anything else to add on the study away front? Well, we could talk a little, just a little bit about a, a Connecticut College-based study away program, which is study away, teach away, where Connecticut College faculty have taken students abroad to a setting. We used to do that routinely in Vietnam. I had the opportunity to do that and also to, to go to Italy with a group of students. And we just had our 10 year SADA reunion for our Vietnam class. And it, it's incredible the kinds of um, intellectual and personal bonds you form with students when you're you know, living and studying together. It's, it's, it can be challenging, but also very rewarding experience. So there are a number of different ways um, we at the college support study away and some involving our own faculty. Deb, I'm gonna throw the next one at you. Uh, Ainsley okay. is asking, uh, what is the marine biology program at Khan? Thank you for that, Ainsley. You're muted, Deb. Sorry. Um, so we are located here right on the Long Island Sound. Um, and uh, so there's an, uh, a number of marine biology opportunities. There's several faculty members whose research um, is focused um, on marine aspects. Uh, um, uh, we have a, a new colleague, Maria Rosa, actually, who, who studies corals um, and mussels. Um, and environmental impacts, um, both here um, in the local area, as well as she's taken students to Columbia 
Um, there's a site there, and she has plans for other um, other sites. Um, Anne Bernhardt studies uh, microbiomes within, so the microbes that are within um, salt marshes, um, and and understanding sort of the ecological and uh, molecular level. Um, so, and then we actually have opportunities for students to study away at the marine biological laboratories and have collaborations. Um, um, and come back and, and continue working on projects as well. And some, so they can actually go out in, in big ships into the ocean um, and do that. So, yeah. Any uh, follow up, Ainley? Okay. Uh, Noel, here we go. Uh, Nate wants to know can someone talk more about the entrepreneurial uh, entrepreneurship pathway? So you and Perva and uh, Mark can jump on this one. Absolutely. <clears throat> Excuse me. So um, we were one of the first pathways, one of the first sort of group of nine, I think it was, or 10. Um, so we have, we've, we're in our fourth or fifth year at this point. Um, the way the pathway runs, I, I am the co-coordinator with Dave Chavane from the economics department. And um, so we run the, the first class. So all pathways, uh, students join in, the, the, in their sophomore year. So you declare in the first semester of your sophomore year, and you actually join the pathway in the second semester. We have had first years who have come on board in the entrepreneurship pathway um, because of their backgrounds, and, and that's fine as well. You still, you just, you can't declare it until your sophomore year. Um, but the way the pathway works is the, the sophomore, the gateway class, um, that we run that as an incubator space. So students come in, uh, and we'll talk about what are, you know, what are social enterprises, how do you, you know, how do you set those up? Uh, and then students will group into venture groups where they'll, uh, they'll look into actually what does it take to start a venture um, for something that, that their group is interested in. This year, it's quite interesting because most of the, um, most of the ventures are about, they're about social justice. So as, as one would expect, last year's group and the year before was for some interesting reason, almost all about fashion startups ways to do fashion in different ways, ways, ways to make it much more sustainable. So the cohorts change every year, which is really exciting for me because um, I follow the cohort from the time they come in till the time they graduate. And we do have some who have gone off uh, to try and actually make their ventures come alive. Um, in addition uh, to, the, to the group venture, we ask every student to come up with what we call an animating question which is something that they're passionate about, something they're, they're interested in that, that, that is around the topics that, that we're presenting in the, in the class. And then students are uh, expected to choose their coursework and perhaps um, you know, study away or internships, other types of, of out of the classroom experiences to inform that question. And then they come back together as a group in the senior year and we have everybody present out at a November symposium, uh, the Fiat College Symposium for, um, for Pathways and Centers. So it's actually, it's quite a lot of fun. Um, this, this year's group, just to give some examples of some of the projects uh, <clears throat> that, that we are going to partner with some of them because they, they map onto things that we're doing through the college. Uh, we have two groups, two groups that are doing work um, in the New London area for providing peer, peer tutoring um, to high school students. So we're going to, you know, we're going to support them through the Academic Resource Center to make that happen. And I will say that both of those groups are are 100 athletes so there's they're, they're all athletes they really want to do something in the local in, in the local community um, so they're going to partner the, the other there are three groups actually and this makes me happy because i do a lot of financial literacy teaching through the college um, we have three groups that are interested in developing some form of app uh, that will help young students under, start to understand financial literacy earlier uh, so that once they leave college, um, understanding that $50,000 salary for a New York City position probably is not the greatest salary to try and accept. Um, and that's another one that we're going to partner with because, as I said, I do a lot of work uh, in that. So those are just some of the examples that are going on. Um, you know, any, any and all types of ventures are, are being considered. So thank you for the question. Yeah, Perva, Mark, you got any? I know you folks have a lot of student athletes in the econ department. Do you guys have any, have any things to add on that front? Yeah, I think that one of the things that comes from having so many student athletes in economics is the fact that they have great community. 
you know, not just, uh, you know, outside of the classroom, but also inside of the classroom. So um, multiple years, you, you, can, you can count on people um, to give you uh, sort of this community of learning. I, I think that's the best way of put, putting it. And so when we think of helping minorities, you know, in economics, uh, for example, women or minorities in economics, we want to structure that based on the communities that we see in among athletes. So this is something that you know we want to learn from, and and it's and it's great in economics, I think. All right. Thank you for that. Was it? I think it was Nate who asked that question. Thank you for that. Um, Aiden would like to know if we can discuss foreign language study and. Uh, how is that included in non-language majors? How about if I start because um, international relations has a very strong language component, so does CISLA. Um, so I think that the way that I would express this is by saying, um, so it depends, first off, just to speak for the foreign languages gently, the particular language um, have their departments and they have different ways of entering. So for some of them, there's a placement exam so that you know that you're landing in the right course. For some of them, it's a placement interview. There's different ways um, that the departments reach out and there's different um, approaches to language within the department in terms of there's comparative literature, there's cultural studies, um, there's politics and the social sciences, there's the arts. And so language is not understood exclusively as literature, although literature forms a, a rich core for the study of, of language. In terms of other departments and, and the interaction between the languages and other departments, there's two things that I would highlight. Um, one is, as I mentioned before, international relations has language as part of its major requirement, and you have to achieve a certain level of language, and you see this also, for example, in CISLA. Um, but that idea that language is integral to learning and research and communication is very much at the heart of a number of different departments and programs. And so you'll see that encouraged um, either formally through requirements or informally through advising and the like. Um, and the second, so there's a feedback loop, which I think is, is part of what Professor Devlin was referring to um, in talking about the liberal arts and seeing things as integrated. And then also part of just, we live in a complex globalized world. And if you wanna be able to participate, you have to understand one another at, at multiple levels. The other thing that I would just draw attention to um, for folks that are interested is that we have um, the foreign languages across the curriculum, FLAC, FLAC, courses, which are one credit courses. And these are taught um, in juxtaposition with a four credit course. So for example, if you're taking China's Rise, which is a 200 level course in the Gov Department, our professor John Chen teaches a one credit FLAC. And you would take the one credit as an optional addition and your reading in that course is going to be done in Chinese. So you have your four credit course and then you have the meetings with the one credit folks um, and they're doing extra work. They receive extra credit for it. Right. Um, and they're having the opportunity to talk in China, Chinese and do their reading and so forth. The thing that I'll just finish off with this, having um, sat in on Professor Chen's courses a number of times, because he draws so broadly from across the college, his courses count in government and IR and East Asian studies and, and on down the line. Um, it's just amazing the questions that get asked in that class. And so you go, I mean, I was sitting there thinking this is really like, it's intellectually exciting because you go from a question about, you know, a character and how a character is formed to a question about the artistry of the character to a question about the politics that spawned the artistry that led to the character. And for me, um, in US politics, I think I get used to the connections. So when I get to visit somebody else's class in a field that I'm less familiar with, and doing things that I don't ordinarily do. I, I mean, I'm in English all the time. It's really exciting. So I think that the language connections are alive and well at Khan, um, and they're they're exciting. <laughs> yeah, thanks for that question, Aiden. Um, I could I could just add on just yep. uh, um, this isn't offered regularly, but actually um, with one of our courses, uh, genetics, um, we've had a, a FLAC. It's called the FAC. The FAC Foreign language across the curriculum um, um, that Professor Borelli was just speaking about, um, and <clears throat> so Julie Kushigan, Professor Kushigan in the, in the Hispanic Studies Department, 
um, collaborated um, with myself and also also um, when uh, another colleague taught the course too, to offer this one credit course. So students who were in the genetics course who also were um, taking uh, Spanish classes um, were able to engage in topics related to, we actually focused on issues in Latin America and um, genetically modified organisms. Um, some bioethic aspects too, um, and so that was uh, uh, you know everything was in in Spanish. That was it was fun, um, and I think the students really um, really like that cross um, disciplinary engagement. Let's see, before okay, we... can I just talk a little bit about language support um, through the the academic resource center? So being that all students have to take a language, <clears throat> you have to take it, uh, at least two semesters of it. Um, invariably, I see students who are really nervous, really scared, quite honestly, about taking language. They say that, you know, um, they don't feel comfortable in it. They, you know, uh, for any number of reasons, that it, like, is it required? Just, uh, just open your heads. It is required. Okay. And as Professor Borelli said, as Professor Eastman said, um, it is, I mean, it's important um, in, in where we are today. We have so, so much support available for students who are, who are taking language. You know, it, I, I don't think we see many students who are taking language for the first time, but we see students who are taking this language or a new language for the first time. So we know that we know it's going to be challenging, but we want you to challenge yourself. And, and hence, we hire we hire so many students to work with with all of the language departments, um, not only to tutor for the specific courses, but we also sponsor with the um, with the language lab. We sponsor uh, a, a lunch language series where you can you can sit at a table when we're allowed to. Um, you can sit at a table and have lunch <laughs> with people um, and and speak. So, don't be afraid to challenge yourself with the language, you know, just, just come in ready to do it. All right, well, thank you for that. Um, let's see, uh, Marco asks, what is the environmental science program like? I think Deb, this one's in your wheelhouse. Yes, I can, I can answer that. I'm, I'm actually a, a developmental biologist, sort of in the molecular cell area, but, um, but um, my colleagues here in biology and um, in, in chemistry and um, actually across campus in in um, uh, in government, right? Um, in um, let's see, colleague actually uh, botany. Um, so lots of folks across. It's very across campus. It's very uh, a multidisciplinary approach to the program. I, I it actually was one of the first um, environmental studies programs in the country. Um, and uh, so a lot of history. We actually are located, um, the college itself is within um, an arboretum. Um, and so lots of long longitudinal studies that um, uh, folks who's, who are in environmental studies um, have been able to contribute to, and students um, and faculty. We have a, a center, the Good Engineering Center um, for the Environment. So students who want to pursue a certificate program um, 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 which is uh, you know, in sort of collaborative and interdisciplinary nature. And then you can major in environmental studies with a different track, either natural sciences or, or social sciences track. So, um, so I would say that um, many, many students, it is definitely one of the uh, more popular majors and lots of different angles and, and research opportunities to, um, to follow in that. And anybody else, I mean, that maybe um, if anyone else wants to, from other disciplines to chime yeah. in. I can add to that. You know, there's a, a science track as well as a social science track within environmental studies. And I guess the way I would look at it is the whichever track you choose, um, you can be trained to go into any of what I consider kind of like the three main areas for after environmental studies, which is, you know, scientists, um, policy maker or practitioner. Uh, and those three cover most of what you would uh, do if you stayed within the environmental science major. But I would say for any major you do, and I say this to our chemistry majors as well, it's like, you know, even if you don't do what you majored in after you leave, you're gonna do well because you, what you'll be trained in, you know, learning the stuff, so to speak, is the more easy stuff. Learning how to do something interesting with the stuff, that's hard and that comes with practice. And that's kind of what you're gonna get in the classes that we teach is to try to elevate your thinking so that you say, all right, I'm. I'm not, you know, I'm a chemist or I'm studying chemistry, but if I have to learn something in economics or psychology or government, okay, I got to learn the stuff, right? But I've got the portable skills that'll allow me to 
learn this, learn those things. So you can kind of say, well, you know, if someone's teaching you, assume I know nothing, but assume really good ability to learn it. Right? That's awesome, Stan. If I could add something, um, a question or something that um, our faculty could elaborate on a little bit is the academic opportunities for research with professors. Um, I think this is one of the greatest areas that Khan distinguishes themselves, ourselves as a college um, from other higher education in institutions. We have experts in their field. Um, they have all the right in the world to not allow students to um, be a part of their research um, because they're doing very important research, um, but they actually desire, um, you know, as Professor Brelli was saying, um, to learn from the students as well and to partner with them. And so I wonder um, if some of you could touch on your experiences doing research with students. Yeah, and that segues into a question that um, from Mariano, Mariano about uh, internship opportunities and things like that. So we can build on that. Could, oh, I, oh, could, I, go ahead, yeah, could I speak to this a little bit? Beyond the opportunities for individual study, which are one semester in length typically, or an honors thesis, which is your senior year, which is two semesters in length, many faculty members run separate research groups that are totally outside of a credit bearing entity. And so what that means is that students who are interested in collaborating on research topics with a professor spend the time to work on those projects. And I've been really fortunate to run an environmental psychology research group in the psychology department. And um, we've just had two papers accepted for publication this year. Uh, an honors thesis a student did with me last year has just been published. And so I think there's such great opportunity for students to have a sophisticated um, interaction with faculty that leads to a product that they can be proud of. And that is actually fairly rare, I would say, at non-research one institutions to see that kind of output um, from undergraduates. And I think we we prepare students, at least in psychology, from the very beginning in terms of foundation courses and then a really strong statistics and research methods course that has students do individual projects and not just a group project. And so they are learning skills that I see leading to internships, leading to jobs, because they can speak about this, I think, slightly unusual kind of uh, training that they've had that is uh, uncommon in my experience. And uh, employers come back to us because they like our graduates and they wanna hire more of them because our students have those skills that are really valued. Mark, you were gonna say something? Yeah, just adding on to what Professor Devlin said. So uh, there's a lot of opportunities in economics to do research. So for example, a few years back, a student approached me who had taken a few classes with me wanted to look at kind of the intersection of economics and healthcare and kind of why healthcare was so expensive in the United States. And the student was able to apply for a ConSharp grant, which is a grant through the college that allows, it, it funds basically you staying on campus over the summer and gives you like a monthly stipend. Um, and then you engage in research with a faculty member. And so we, from there, we jumped into this topic. It was something new for me. We were doing it together. Uh, we we're looking at basically like changes in the law that led to kind of uh, different strategies by business in, in healthcare. And then we calculated a counterfactual for basically what healthcare spending could be in the United States if these changes in the law didn't take place. And you know, we recently published a paper also. Um, and there's and more generally, there's, there's uh, a lot of opportunities in, in economics. We have a senior honors thesis like in these other departments where students who have something that they've been interested in throughout their career can basically uh, connect with a faculty member and work through the whole year to, to pursue that project. Um, yeah, so there's a lot of opportunity um, for research and yeah. I'm gonna tell a story. <laughs> so this is about four years ago. Um, I took two students, they were actually rising sophomores. So they asked, they were both in my general chemistry class and they wanted to do research and I said, okay, um, in that spring, just after that, I got an invitation to submit a paper to a special issue of a particular journal, which highlighted research at undergraduate institutions. I was like, oh, great. But I'm like, when's it due? Okay, this was May. Okay, it's due in September. So I'm like, okay, well, um, 
what can I get done? So I, I had a project that's been, that had been sitting around for a long time, but not quite finished. And I said, okay, I put these two students, they were just rising sophomores. I said, okay, well, let's see if you can get the job done. So I gave them very specific research to do, to get the data we needed. And we, it turns out they came through and we published the paper, got accepted. They, had, they were co-authors on the publication in their sophomore year. Um, but more important than that, you know, I got to know them well. And when they applied to other things the next year, I could write them. And this is true of any of these experiences. It allows us as faculty to write really good letters of recommendation because we have specific things to write about. Same thing is true about your athletic experience. Your coaches spend more time with you than most of us will. And they can write really good letters for you as well. So one of those students the next summer got a, a fellowship, an NSF fellowship to work at the University of Minnesota. The other parlayed that experience into a Goldwater uh, scholarship that she carried through the rest of her time at Khan. Go ahead, Bob. Yeah, so I, I did about two and a half years of research uh, in one of the chemistry groups and, and was fortunate to be able to publish four papers uh, from that body of work. And it got me into a good grad school, like everyone's saying, you know, the letters of recommendation were really strong. Um, but uh, when I was applying to my first job in industry at Pfizer, um, after uh, I was there for a few months, my supervisor told me it wasn't my graduate work that got me the job. You know, my PhD was fine, as good as anyone else's for the most part. But he said uh, specifically that the work I did at Khan College was what got me over the line to, uh, you know, get ahead uh, of the pack, uh, you know, from candidates from other, other programs. So, and there's a huge amount of value for doing research as an undergrad. It's, uh, I, I can't overstate how important I think this is. <laughs> yeah, I'll just, I'll just add on one, um, one thing too, from the biology department perspective. Um, we have many students who do honors thesis and do um, summer research. We have a summer science research institute that um, mo all of the science departments actually participate in. Um, and students, we usually have about 60 students per summer and students actually get a, uh, a stipend, a $4,000 stipend um, and are able to um, stay on campus, the, um, housing for free. Um, so that's really a very intensive experience. And then of course, independent studies. Um, we also in biology redesigned our curriculum um, to be very um, investigative um, focus, an investigative inquiry based um, focus. So our intro course now is just 18 students um, with a focus on a particular area, um, but not content, just really skills and designing experiments and um, and analyzing results and, and sort of applying to real world problems. So and then we try to thread that through the rest of the curriculum. So um, so um, and many, many students and athletes included um, in, in, in large numbers wanting to do research and, and get a chance to do both engage in the research and, and then um, go to conferences, national conferences or regional conferences and, and um, publish um, with, with uh, faculty members. I want to make sure we get to all the questions. So we have ones said, could you describe the pathway of choosing uh, a major for an incoming student who is unsure of what they want to do? I think we should make that path into plural though, right? <laughs> Anyone want to take that? I think that the majority of students arrive at Khan um, either unsure of what they're going to major in or absolutely sure of what they're going to major in and then discovering that they don't know that that's what they don't want to major in. Um, I know that when I went to college, my plans were to major in economics because I planned to be the CEO of Citibank. And it took one course in micro for me to go, yeah, not, not, I'm this, no. Um, so I think that what I would say to folks is that um, if, you're, if you're thinking about it and you kind of fall into one of those two categories, um, the, the way that we've designed the pathways and the opportunities that have been set up across graduation requirements, because requirements to me always sound like, right? But these are opportunities to explore and in exploring to kind of start building an integrated approach to your own education. So arriving, you probably know a little bit about yourself and you know a little bit about what you're interested in and your first year seminar advisor is going to pick up on that 
and, and you're going to be exploring it through a first year seminar that's a little bit of what you're interested in. And then you start moving and, and developing and testing yourself. And I think that's something that, that we've all been talking about here is that the motivation, um, there's a lot of support that's coming at you at Con, And in return, there's a lot of encouragement for you to drive yourself. Um, for you to find your own areas of creativity and to realize that, that you have a lot of abilities that you may not have been aware of. Um, I like running. Um, I'm not very fast, but I've been doing a lot of it um, because I crashed and took out my hip, knee and ankle, right? So I had a choice and I decided that running was necessary. And um, my line is anybody can run a marathon if they're willing to put in the miles. And I think that's true for, for an undergraduate education. You don't know what you can do. Um, and please don't crash and burn to find out what you can do. Um, start from the beginning with, with an opportunity that, that the college is sitting there and saying, we're here for you. How can we help you? Here's a first year seminar with an advisor who cares and is gonna listen to you talk um, three times a week actually, right? And, and then you're going to move into a major with professors that are going to say, why do you care? And more, why should I care? I know why I care as a professor, but why should I care because you care as a student? And I think that that dynamic that moves you into research groups and gives you opportunities and allows you to publish the way that um, Mr. Kine was talking about, Dr. Kine, I'm sorry, was talking about, um, there's a lot of dynamics that are going on there that, that cause the external forces and the internal forces to encourage you to pick a major that is expressive of yourself. And we've got a lot of them. So you're gonna find a lot of opportunities to share in a dialogue from yourself. Everybody's path is different. Uh, I'll tell you another story. This is from quite a while ago. Uh, he was a point guard for the men's basketball team. He was my advisee and he came in as a pre-med mate. He wanted to go pre-med. So, um, so I would, I advised him, you know, take these courses and he took them and then we'd meet, you know, throughout the semesters and he'd always say, boy, you know, I'm really struggling in my science classes. And then we'd diverge into his history course, which he said he really liked so much. And after a while, I just asked him, like, every time we talk, you know, we talk, we start talking about you're being pre-med, but then you end up talking about how much you really love history. And he was like, yeah, I know, I really love it. It's like, well, why don't you major in that then? <laughs> so he did. He ended up being, I think, the S either the SGA or the senior class president or something like that. Uh, went on, became very successful. But, you know, he, it was Marianne said, he, he came in thinking he was interested in majoring one thing, found his way. And a lot of it was his discovery. But, you know, you're, you're going to be able to speak with faculty, other students, and especially those of you who are fall athletes will get a whole team. You can talk to your, your, uh, your fellow students, which really helps you kind of navigate and find your own individual pathway. Like I said, all, everyone's path to finding a major is different. So the thing is, you know, trust the process and, and trust the people you're around because they're all looking after you. Can I just add one like follow-up? Um, and that is um, the coaches are phenomenal. I mean, I've worked with most of the coaches at this point. I think there's very few that I haven't haven't had an opportunity to interact with. Like, and right now I'm, I'm meeting Mackenzie and it's just fantastic, right? So I think that that's something else is that there's not a competition for attention going on here. We're all faculty members. Some of us are on playing fields or courts and some of us are mostly in a classroom or a lab, but we're all faculty members and we have great respect for the work that one another does. And I think that that right there, the number of times I've gotten um, referred um, a student by, by a faculty member, by a coach, listen to me, right? Um, by a fellow uh, coach in, on the faculty, it's, it's, in, it's, it's innumerable. And I've served as a faculty fellow on two very different teams, women's field hockey and men's ice hockey. Um, and again, you know, it's just, it's the same in terms of that support system that you've got going for you. So I, I can't really say enough about the academic respect that I have for the coaches and that the coaches have shown to me. It's just, I've seen it at very few other schools. Yeah, Marianne, the, the field hockey players appreciate you passing out the programs at the home games. I know, they were kind of like, what are you doing here? It's like learning field hockey. This is a weird game. Uh, thank you for that. Um, speaking from a coach's perspective as well, I mean, our student athletes um, are so fortunate to have faculty that support them in all aspects of their life here at Con, whether it's, you know, theater, music, or athletics, or whatever else, or other extracurricular activities they're involved in. Um, you care about them as a whole person, 
um, and not just when they're sitting in front of you in their classroom. And, and again, it's very rare. It doesn't happen um, at every institution. And so something that I think the people at Con value very highly. Um, and as prospective student athletes, you all should too and, and, um, and really use it um, when you get here. So thank you. Um, I would like to wrap up. We've about five minutes left. Um, I'd like to wrap it up and kind of go through each panelist and ask you, what is your favorite part about being a professor, being faculty and working at Connecticut College? Anybody want to jump in? I'll start. <laughs> um, because uh, I just actually was sharing this with my cells and molecules class. Um, we had some students, uh, actually alums come in um, who are heading a biotech company running um, um, uh, CRISPR um, technology. And I was so excited to have this engagement between these alums, these um, gone on to do amazing things, um, and the students sitting in the class engaged in this material and the lights, um, you know, all, all the, the lights going up uh, and on for everyone. And just, um, I love my research. I get super excited about it, but really love what I love, love most and which really drives me as a professor is the enthusiasm and the engagement and the, um, um, the progress that students uh, make while they're here and then, you know, when they go on um, in their lives as, as, you know, both professionally and, and personally. So thank you. I just want to follow on with what, <clears throat> with what Professor Eastman said. Um, I think the best part of my job, and honestly, I think I, I have the best job on campus because I get to work with every student, um, is the student. Okay, I live an hour away from the college, but I'm there a lot. I'm there early in the morning, I'm there late at night, I'm on the weekends. Um, and it's, I never want a student to have to wait more than 24 hours to, to get any kind of help that they, that they have. So we try and make sure that that happens. So um, anytime a new group of students walks in, I just, I can't wait to meet them. Um, you know, and I, I just, I, I love working with them on all different levels. As I said, the Academic Resource Center is not a place you go when you're in trouble. It is a place you go when you are in trouble. But it's not a place you go just because there's trouble. It's you come in and just talk about what you're doing, how you're doing it, how you can make it better, um, and we'll get resources to you to help to, to help that happen. So, um, and again, I, I just want to echo the, the fact of how important the coaches are to my job, um, because again, like Professor Ching said, y'all see them way more than way more than I do. So whatever whatever you're hearing is really important for us to help work with. So. I'm happy to go next. Um, I have heard this a few times today in this session about how faculty and students working together is um, it's a real motivator and uh, one of the best parts of our job. And I and I believe that's the case for me as well. Um, I just had a student uh, guest speak in one of my courses that she had taken about five years ago, and she's a, a graduate student now, and she's getting ready to do her dissertation and the students in the class were had really great questions and and it made me realize you know wow we're having some impact on students going forward and it's really exciting it was just a really great moment when my current students were asking my former student these great questions so i think that's that's a really important thing that makes this job so amazing Go ahead, Anne. Okay. I teach a course called Research Methods. It's not everybody's favorite course, either to take or to teach. <laughs> but uh, people start at the beginning of the semester without an idea of doing a project. And we're coming up to uh, um, the weeks when students present research that they have conducted themselves sort of soup to nuts and it is such a proud moment for me to see them present their research and i just i cannot think of anything more fulfilling for me or i hope for them than to have done something from the beginning to the end by yourself essentially in the course of a single semester and after almost 50 years of, of being at connecticut college 
I would definitely not still be here unless it were for the reward I get from teaching students um, those kinds of techniques and methods. Mark, how about you? Maybe I could. Oh, oh. Mark and then Bob, how's that? Okay. Um, yeah, no, the, the interactions with students at Khan is just amazing. Um, I went to a bigger undergraduate uh, school and definitely had much less interaction with both my advisor, who I think I met once the entire time, and with, with teachers in general. And at Khan, it's very much different. You're, you're, uh, you have a, a number of connections, you know, in and outside of class, uh, interacting with students, and, and definitely an, an incredibly rewarding thing for uh, working at Khan is just seeing students like. And for my case, talk economics, you know, debate these topics that, you know, I'm also so passionate about and hear them share that same interest is, is, is just great. Um, and also, as we were saying before, just intertwining kind of, you know, my research or, you know, research in general with the class, bringing it in either like in teaching it in, in a given class for a specific topic or actually engaging in research with students is, is also extremely rewarding. Yeah, being in my first year, I've been really happy to see, uh, uh, in a way, how little has changed. The students are still amazingly engaged. They work together so well. Uh, they very actively engage faculty in, in what I think is a pretty unique way. Uh, and so it's exciting for me to be on the other side of the table now and, uh, you know, help, help these students, uh, you know, with their coursework, but also start to figure out what a career path could look like, um, you know, my experience in the biopharmaceutical industry, I think has been really interesting for some of the chemistry students as they start to tease apart uh, what they'd like to do and, and how to get there. So uh, it's, it's been an interesting full circle experience for me. For me, I love the fact that um, all these spaces that I'm looking at in the screen, we interact so closely at Connecticut College that discipline you know, is not a barrier. And uh, the, the question about double majoring, that is so common in, um, at Connecticut College. And it goes for faculty interactions as well. I have um, joint research projects with uh, psychology, computer science, math. Um, and I hope as I'm looking at the screen right now, I'm tempted to um, uh, collaborate with chemistry and biology perhaps in the future. So that kind of opportunity, I think, uh, I love having interacting with students and fellow faculty members. Marianne? I think the thing that I like is the surprises um, because people are willing to say what's in their heads um, in a way that's respectful of, of what's in other people's heads. And, and they're also kind of trying to fit different life experiences together. So I never stop learning. And if there's times when I'm teaching, there's an awful lot of times when I'm, that teaching is about trying to keep up. I will never forget um, advising my senior men's ice hockey players, several of whom had had, you know, careers in the juniors. And so I'm talking with 25 year old men who are thinking about planning how to finish their undergraduate education. And they are in a very different place from my 18 year olds who are walking in the door in my first year seminar, um, who, in that particular class, I didn't have any, you know, ice hockey players who had been in juniors before. So I love the surprise of it. And I love the fact that, that people are willing to gift me with those surprises. Yeah, and I'll let's say two things. I, the thing I, I really love is watching students develop from their first year into their final year and watch that professional and intellectual growth and, and see how they develop beyond college, you know, how they succeed. And the other thing I like is, you know, if someone had asked me, you know, what the, the you know, the secret is when you, when you become a faculty member at a school like this, um, there's a lot of stuff you you do that you weren't told that you'd end up be doing. And I, my involvement with athletics has been really rich. And I, one of the things that I cherish most about my work here, I've gotten to lots of opportunities from that. Uh, other outgrowths from that that was inspired by athletics. I now work with uh, Green Dot, if you're not familiar with that. It's a bystander intervention program, which I got involved with really inspired by the student athletes who got involved with it. And I thought as faculty athletic rep, I should follow their lead. So it's allowed me a lot of opportunities that I would not have, definitely not have thought I'd get involved with when I first got to this job. And I've been doing this for like 30 years, <laughs> over 30 years now. Wow, well, thank you. I just wanna extend my gratitude and thanks to everyone who joined us on this panel. I know that it was, um, very valuable for our prospective student athletes to see your passion um, and your care for the students that um, come into your class.
classrooms and into your world. Um, so thank you for joining us um, and, and thank you for all of our attendees as well. We hope to meet all of you folks in person sometime. <laughs> Definitely. Have a great day, everyone.